Relatively tall, mountainous cheekbones, dimples like donuts, and skin the color of Indian corn, she left life in the South for what was then the promised land up north. Although she lived, loved, raised the family, and worked for her, over half her life up north, the soft lyrical accents of her southern tongue never really left her. Words of single syllable found a new one in her mouth, often rising on the second syllable. Keith became Keith, child became child, and her reedy, lengthy laughter lit up a room like a legal holiday. She and her children lived in the PJs, the projects, but it wasn't until years later, when we were grown, that we understood we lived in poverty, for our mother made sure our needs were met. She was a gentle woman who spoke well of most folk, if at all, but was like a lioness when one of her children were attacked. In the early 60s, when her daughter got caught up in a neighborhood fracas that boiled out of control, she snapped a broomstick in two, whipped open a path down the block to where her daughter stood, paralyzed by terror, grabbed her and whipped her back home. Only when she was safely back indoors was it found that she had been slashed while outdoors. She never noticed, so powerful was her love for her daughter. Deep rivers of loving strength flowed through her. It is my belief that a mother's love is the foundation of every love that follows. It is the primary love relationship, the first that humans experience, and as such a profound influence on all subsequent and secondary relationships in life. It is a love relationship that surpasses all reason. Perhaps that's why I thought she would live forever, that this woman who carried me, my brothers and a sister, would never know death. For over 30 years, she smoked cigarettes, Pall Mall called Pell-Mells and Marlboros, but I still thought she would live forever. When she died of emphysema while I was imprisoned, it was like a lightning bolt to the soul. Never, during my entire existence, had there been a time when she was not there. Suddenly, on a cold day in February, her breath ended, and her sweet presence, her wise counsel, was gone forever. To see one's mother die while imprisoned, to see her lifeless form while held in shackles from death row, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. It has been over three decades since I last looked into his face, but I find him now sometimes hidden in the glimpse of a mirror. He was short of stature, shorter than I at ten years, fully smoothly bald with a face the color of walnuts. He walked with a slight limp and smoked cigars, usually fillies. Although short, he wasn't slight, but was powerfully built with a thickness, not a fatness of form. His voice was deep, with the accents of the South wrapped around each word, sweet and sticky like molasses. His words often tickled his sons, and they tossed them among themselves like prizes found in the depths of crackerjack boxes, words that were wondrous in their newness, their rarity, their difference from all others heard. Boys, cut out that tussling, hear me? And the boys would stop their wrestling, their bellies near bursting with swallowed, swollen laughter, the word vibrating, sotto voce, barely heard in their throats. Tussling, 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 tussling. For days, for weeks, these silly little boys had a new toy, and with this one word could reduce the others to teary-eyed fits of fall-on-the-floor laughter. Tussling. He was a relatively old man when he seated these sons, and because of his age of over half a century, he was openly affectionate in a way not usual for a man of his time. He kissed them, dressed them, and taught them by example that he loved them. He talked with them, and walked, and walked, and walked with them. Dad, I want to ride, I whined. It ain't good for you to ride so much, boy. Walking is good for you, good exercise for you. Decades later, I would hear that echo in one of my sons, and my reply would echo my father's. His eyes were the eyes of age, so discolored by time they seemed bluish, but there was a perpetual twinkle of joy in them, of love and living. He lived just over a decade into this son's life, 
and his untimely death from illness left holes in the souls of his sons. Without a tether, I sought and found father figures like Black Panther Captain Reggie Shell and Black Panther Party Defense Minister Huey P. Newton, and indeed the Black Panther Party itself, which in this period of utter void taught me, fed me, and made me a part of a vast and militant family of revolutionaries. Many good men and women became my teachers, my mentors, and my examples of a revolutionary ideal. Zayd Malik Shakur, murdered by police when Asada was wounded and taken. Geronimo Gijaga, also known as Pratt, who commanded the LA chapter of the BPP with distinction and defended the party from deadly state attacks, himself a political prisoner, who because of the state's frame up and judicial repression has been separated from his family and children for a quarter of a century. Here, in this restrictive place of fathers without their children and men who were fatherless, one senses and sees the social costs of that loss. Those unloved find it virtually impossible to love, and those who were fatherless find themselves alienated and at war with their own communities and families. My own sons were babies when I was cast into this hell. Neither letters, cards, nor phone calls could heal the wounds that they and their sisters suffered during the long, lonely years of separation. Here, in this man-made hell, I find young men bubbling with bitter hatreds and roiling resentments against absent fathers, several who have taken to the odd habit of calling this writer Papa, certainly high irony, when one notes this writer was himself an absent father and now absent grandfather. Perhaps conscious of this irony, I resisted the nickname until I could no longer. I realized that I lived amidst a generation of young men drunk, not only with alienation, but also with father hunger. I had the Black Panther Party. Who did they have? Well, here they have Delbert Africa, Geronimo Gijaka, Chucky Africa, Mike, Ed, and Phil Africa, Dr. Mutulu Shakur, Sundiata Akoli, and other old heads like myself. I realized that I resented being papa to young men I didn't know, while being denied the opportunity to be a present father to the children of my flesh and my heart by the state's banishment. I was also in denial, for who was the old head they were calling? Certainly not I. It took a trip, a trek, to the shiny steel burnished mirror on the wall, where I found my father's face staring back at me to recognize the real. I am he, and they are me. From death row, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. Lydia Baroshenko, Presente. She was born August 25th, 1947, a daughter of Southerners, but a Philadelphian to her bones. Born into a family of all brothers, toughened her, as demonstrated in her teen years when I saw her knock a boyfriend over a railing. He seemed more shocked than hurt, but it's possible he hid his pain to protect his male ego. Back then, she was called Penny for her dark, coppery skin and her bright, dazzling smile. She was a dancer of modern dance, and of course danced the moves arising from the R&B era of the Supremes, the Temptations, and Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. She was a good student, and while a young woman, she earned her rating to become a registered nurse. She became the mother of two boys, Vernon and Jabari. In 1996, she met and married the renowned black nationalist scholar, author, and reverend Ishaka Musa Barashango, who introduced her to a world of new knowledge and a wealth of subjects. She helped him run the Temple of the Black Messiah, a spiritual home for a growing black nationalist community in Philadelphia. She worked as a youth counselor and operated a rites of passage program for young troubled black girls. She loved her people, her children and grandchildren, and her brothers. Lydia Omiemi Barashango succumbed to breast cancer just days after her 64th birthday. She will be lovingly remembered forever, not only by this brother, but by many other brothers and sisters. From death row, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio. Samia Abdullah, 
makes transition. For most of the activist world, she was Goldie, a rapper and activist, whose sweet voice could strike like bricks when she crafted a rap or sang a song. To us, she was Sammy, short for Samia, a brilliant, sparkling young woman who never ceased to surprise us. She was many things, daughter, mother, student, activist, artist, orator, rapper, graduate, and more. To us, she was the baby, the youngest, and as such, she had a special shine. It's a funny thing. To a parent, a child is always a child, even when they're no longer a child. In the mind's eye, they're still a child behind the face and form of an adult. For the last three or four years, Samia was quite ill, bone cancer that spread throughout her body. For years, she had pain in her back, but she bowled through it, thinking it would heal itself. In 2011, she finally went in for examination and found what no one expected to find, cancer. She did what she always did. She fought for life despite diagnosis. In fact, she was in her hospital bed, finishing up her psychology studies, forcing herself to graduate with a master's degree. Her entire graduating class saluted her will to prevail. She fought for years against the invasion of cancer, the wretched chemotherapies and wrenching pain. Still, she fought. What strength this little woman had. A song came to me, again, of her as a child. As long as I breathe, I remember this scene. Your little fists banging like a hammer, banging on the glass. Slam it almost crash, tears falling like a rain. Little one, oh my little one, how could I ever forget that day? You shouted, break it, break it. It rang like a bell all day. It's been a lifetime since. You're banging with your fist, and you're not a little girl anymore. You shouted, break it. You shouted, break it. How could I ever forget that day? You shouted, break it. You shouted, break it. It rings like a bell every day. I know it's been a lifetime ago. You're not a baby anymore, but as long as I breathe, I remember this scene. Your little fists banging like hammer, banging on the glass, slam it almost caress. Tears are falling like rain. Little one, oh my little one. How could I ever forget that day? You shouted, break it, break it. It rings like a bell all day. It rings like a bell all day. So Mia and I never finished this song. As she breathed her last, she was sitting on her mother's lap, just as she did as a child. No longer a child, yes, but a child again. Samia Abdullah's song has ended, but like the sweetest music, it remains with us, repeating rhythms and refrains. She remains with us, echoing in our souls. She is a song we will sing forever. From Imprisoned Nation, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio.